Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Villa Raza and Angenko who will be providing a practical guide to Philippine labour and employment laws. My name is Dan Sanpeo and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Rochelle Pomoy is a partner and the deputy head of the firm's labour and employment practice group. She is experienced in both advisory and litigation aspects of Philippine labour law practice. She represents domestic and international clients on all aspects of employment and industrial relations, including general employment advisory and assistance, employee investigation, employment and industrial relations disputes, international transfers and global mobility matters, large scale reductions in workforce and corporate restructures, and the employment aspects associated with corporate transactions. Caleb Laredo is an associate of the Labour and Employment Practice Group. His practice focuses on both contentious and non-contentious aspects of labour and employment, including labour standards compliance, investigation and termination procedures, and reviews of various employment documents. He also handles data privacy matters in relation to labour and employment. Now, before I hand over to our panel to begin today's webinar, a housekeeping item. You can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page and we will endeavour to answer as many of your questions during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation so please do get those questions in. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to our panel to begin. Thank you. Thank you so much Dan. Good day to everyone and welcome to today's webinar entitled Introduction to Philippine Labor and Employment Laws. My name is Rachel Ann Pomoy, and I am a partner at Villaraza and Nang Angwa, our VNA Law, and the deputy group head of the Labor and Employment Practice Group of the firm. I will be your speaker today, and I will be joined by my colleague, Caleb Laureda. Today, we will go through the basics of Philippine Labor and Employment Law, and in particular, Next slide, please. We will go through these particular topics, the legal framework in the Philippines, principles of labor and employment law, the different types of employment contracts and other contracts engaging workers in the Philippines, the basic rights and responsibilities of workers in the Philippines, procedures for terminating employment, laws governing labor unions, and laws governing foreign workers uh, engaged to work in the Philippines. So um, as towards the end of, of the webinar, we will also have a short update on the latest updates in the field of labor and employment law in the Philippines. In relation to the legal framework, <clears throat> um, it, we should understand that the protection to labor is constitutionally enshrined. So the 1987 Constitution of the Philippines contains express provisions uh, regarding the protection of labor. In particular, the 1987 Constitution, Article 13, Section 3, specifically provides the following, that the state shall afford full protection to labor, local and overseas, organized and unorganized, and promote full employment and equality of employment opportunities for all. It shall guarantee the rights of all workers to self-organization, collective bargaining and negotiations, and peaceful concerted activities, including the right to strike in accordance with law. They shall be entitled to security of tenure, humane conditions of work, and a living wage. They shall also participate in policy and decision-making processes affecting their rights and benefits as may be provided by law. The state shall promote the principle of shared responsibility between workers and employers and the preferential use of voluntary modes in settling disputes, including conciliation, and shall enforce their mutual compliance therewith to foster industrial peace. The state shall regulate the relations between workers and employers, recognizing the right of labor to its just share and the fruits of production and the right of enterprises to reasonable returns of investments and to expansion and growth. So the main source of labor, of labor loss would be 
the very constitution itself. Now, there are also other statutes enacted that would also be material in, in understanding the framework of labor and employment in the Philippines. So the principal authority which has been enacted is the Philippine Labor Code. It was initially enacted in 1974 and since then has gone several revisions. It contains the basic rights and responsibilities of both the employers and the employees, as well as the power of the regulators, particularly the Department of Labor and Employment. So our Philippine Labor Code is divided into two major portions, the labor standards provisions and the labor relations provisions. Labor standards refer to the minimum requirements prescribed by the law, um, particularly relating to wages, hours of work, cost of living allowance, other monetary and welfare benefits, and occupational safety and health standards. On the other hand, labor relations, uh, it, the labor relations provision provisions govern the interaction between the employer and the employees and would touch upon the topic of collective bargaining, unionization. Apart from the labor code, there are also other statutes, laws enacted by Congress that particularly uh, regulate labor and employment laws in the Philippines, including the um, Matern expanded Maternity Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Standards Law, among other special laws. Yet another source of, of um, regulation in the Philippines for labor and employment would be the issuances of the regulator, the Department of Labor and Employment. So it does that by issuing implementing rules and regulations of certain statutes. Um, department orders, advisories, and memorandum circulars. Finally, the Philippine Supreme Court is also a source of, of law in the Philippines because it is, um, it under the Philippine Civil Code, decisions of the Supreme Court form part of the law of the land and its case law. So um, the Supreme Court decisions are also um, source of labor and employment laws in the Philippines. Next slide, please. So let us go through the key features of Philippine employment laws. So these are the essential repeated topics that, that one encounters um, in, in viewing Philippine employment laws. So the first of these principles would be that in case of doubt, in labor cases, they will be resolved in favor of labor because the principle of social justice um, says that when the conflicting interests of labor and capital are weighed on the scales of social justice, the heavier influence of the latter, of capital, must be counterbalanced by the sympathy and compassion the law must accord to the underprivileged worker. So there is um, a recognition of the imbalance and the power between the two. And so if there is doubt, then um, the, the in, it will be interpreted in favor of labor. So um, this, however, does not mean that it's labor that must prevail all the time. So if there is no doubt, then it will be interpreted as is. So the Philippine Supreme Court itself has recognized that while the Constitution is committed to the policy of social justice and the protection of the working class, it should not be supposed that every labor dispute will be automatically decided in favor of labor because management also has its own rights, which as such are entitled to respect and enforcement in the interest of simple fair play. So we have on one hand the principle of social justice, but also there is an express recognition of management prerogative. The next pillar, the next key feature of Philippine employment law is management prerogative. It is the recognition that the employer has the power to regulate all aspects of employment. So the right of the employer to regulate the aspects of employment include the right to hire, to assign work, to prescribe methods of working, the time, the place, and the manner of work, the tools to be used, processes to be followed, the extent of supervision of the worker, 
working regulations, transfers, demotions, promotions, and of course, dismissals and the power to discipline. So the exercise of management prerogative, of course, is not absolute. And um, the limitation is that it shouldn't be used in order to de defeat or circumvent the rights of employees. And, and the third principle that, that completes this, the essential or the key features of Philippine employment law would be the right to security of tenure. In the provision that I read earlier on uh, Section uh, 3, Article 13 of the 1987 Constitution, there is an express recognition of the right to security of tenure of employees. So at this point, it's already clear. It should be made clear. There is no termination at will because there is security of tenure and separating an employee from employment um, requires going through the legal process of separating, terminating either via cause, via just cause or via authorized cause, which we will discuss later on. So next slide, please. Um, I, I, we are, we've placed this topic here because it's very timely since, um, and in fact, we have gotten some questions from, from the audience regarding this on independent contractors. So these are not employees. They are considered individual independent contractors, which is a relation, which is, um, a relationship recognized by the Philippine Supreme Court. So recognized under Philippine law that um, a corporation or a principal can engage can engage a worker as an individual independent contractor whereby there is no employer employee relationship but the contractor is able to perform work free of control and direction from the principals from the principal except for the results and that there would be specialized skills training on the part of these independent contractors. So um, those two essential requirements would separate an employee from an independent contractor. So again, an independent contractor would have a specialized skill or training that would separate him or her from an ordinary employee. And this independent contractor should be able to perform work free from control and direction of the principal. So if those essential requisites are present, then a worker can be classified as an independent contractor. Now, um, there is an issue as to whether or not um, foreign employers can, can engage workers here in the Philippines as their employees. The, it, there is no express prohibition under Philippine law, but there is um, there are requirements under a statute that would require presence here in the Philippines. So the um, the the answer that's actually consistent with the law is that if a foreign entity or a foreign um, employer uh, a, a foreigner cannot hire a an employee here in the Philippines. So what they what what is normally done is to hire workers as individual independent contractors here in the Philippines and making sure that the essential requisites for an individual independent contracting relationship are present. So such uh, workers as the virtual assistants um, are, are normally engaged as independent contractors. Okay, um, next slide please. So in order to determine whether or not a, a particular worker is an employee of, of um, the employer, uh, the Philippine law has the fourfold test. So um, the employer is the one that has the power of selection and engagement of the employee. It is the one responsible for the payment of wages. It has the power of dismissal and of course the power of control. So the control test is, is the most essential among them. As I've, as I've stated, what differentiates an employee from a contractor is really whether or not there is control on the part of the principal. Okay, um, next slide, please. 
So in relation to the hiring of Filipino workers, let, next slide, please. Okay, so um, hiring of Filipino workers for deployment abroad, um, that is allowed, but it must go through the proper channels. So I discussed earlier the hiring of individual independent contractors who will be present here in the Philippines and will be virtually working. So the governing relationship would be individual independent contracting. Whereas hiring a Filipino worker for de deployment abroad, that's that's an employment relationship and the worker will be present overseas. So um, under Philippine law, no foreigner can hire a uh, Filipino worker directly. So under the 2016 revised EOE rules, the general rule is that no employer shall directly hire an overseas Filipino worker for overseas employment subject to certain exceptions, including um, those, uh, those employers as may be allowed by the Secretary of Labor and Employment, such as professionals and skilled workers with duly executed or authenticated contracts containing terms and conditions over and above the standards set by the POEA or the Philippine Overseas Employment Agency. So um, technically, um, when you, if the if workers are engaged that do not fall under the exceptions, the foreigner the foreign employer must engage a local recruitment agency. So the exception actually, so it says here, professionals and skilled workers. That's actually a narrow exception. It pertains only to the first five hires of the foreigner. And um, one, uh, if in the counting of the five hires, a group is counted as one. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so let me see. So these are the requirements. The employee must first secure a verified copy of the employment contract with the foreign employer and transmit the same to the Philippine Overseas Employment Agency together with certain documentary requirements, including the employee's passport, working visa or working permit, the profile of the company or proof of registration, and a notarized affidavit detailing how this employee found out about the job. So the verification of the employment contract is actually done with the, um, the labor attache's office in the country where the foreigner or the foreign employer is located. So the, the verification process before it gets submitted with the local Philippine Overseas Employment Agency, it has to be verified there in the country of origin with um, the Overseas Labor Office, the Philippine uh, Overseas Labor Office. Next slide, please. Now, um, the, the inverse is to hire foreign workers for deployment here in the Philippines. So is that allowed? We actually got a question regarding that. That's allowed. That's allowed under Philippine law. Um, foreign nationals seeking admission in the Philippines for employment purposes, um, they are allowed, provided that they obtain an alien employment permit. So, um, however, it must be, we have to emphasize that foreign nationals may only be engaged here in the Philippines um, if there is a determination of non-availability of a person in the Philippines who is competent able and willing at the time of the application to perform the services for which the foreigner is being hired here in the Philippines. So um, if the foreign national is employed by companies that are not registered with, so the, the type of visa apart from the alien employment permit um, is dependent on whether the company here in the Philippines is registered with the Bureau of Investments or is located in an economic zone. So a, a foreigner who's going to be employed by a um, domestic company that is registered with the Bureau of Investments, um, 
or um, registered in or located in an, an, an economic zone here in the Philippines would have to secure a visa called the 9G visa, which is issued to foreign nationals who will engage in any lawful occupation in the Philippines for a period of more than six months. On the other hand, uh, for foreign nationals uh, not registered, rather, 9G is for, for not registered with B Bureau of Investments and located in the economic zone. Whereas if a foreign national is employed by an entity that is that is registered uh, with the, the Bureau of Investments or is located in an economic zone, there is a special visa called the 47A2 visa where um, it's a, non, a special non-immigrant visa issued to foreign investors on the basis of public interest or public policy. The, vi the visa is usually given to foreign employees working for special projects. It is company specific and would require that uh, the percentage of foreign national employees of that particular company should not be, uh, should be less than 5% of the total workforce. So if the foreigner um, decides to change jobs, then they will have to secure another visa because it's company specific. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so then we will discuss um, telecommuting or the case of virtual workers. So because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the Philippine landscape has also changed and um, arrangements such as work from home arrangements um, have, have been accepted. So um, actually before the pandemic, there was already um, the Telecommuting Act, which is the law allowing for telecommuting. So which is work from an alternative workplace with the use of telecommunications and or computer technology. So even before the advent of the pandemic, we had already enacted the Telecommuting Act, which became very handy um, when, when the pandemic came. So the key features of the Telecommuting Act are, are two. The first one is the fair treatment principle, which, which means that this, this ensures that employees that are telecommuting are afforded the same minimum labor standards and treatment as those employees that are going on site. So labor standards provisions on overtime, holiday pay, leave entitlement should be the same regardless of whether the employee is telecommuting or on site. It also requires that the telecommuting employees be given the same or comparable workload and performance standards as on-site employees. They should have the same access to training and career development or opportunities, including training on technical equipment at their disposal, uh, which would be comparable to those that are on-site. The second is, of course, a concern for the company's data privacy. So the Telecomputing Act requires that the employers and employees must agree as regards the minimum standards for the protection of personal information. Um, that will be processed. Uh, the employer is responsible for taking the appropriate measures to ensure that there is protection for data and uh, for data used and processed by the telecommuting employee. On the part of the telecommuting employee, these employees shall commit to the data privacy policies uh, embodied in a telecommuting agreement. So the way to actually, and so first for an employee to, to um, be allowed to telecommute, there must be a telecommuting agreement. So it can be done through a fresh telecommuting agreement or an addendum to the already signed employment agreement that telecommuting is allowed. Next slide, please. So um, at this point, we will be discussing, uh, next slide, please. The different type of, the different types of employees in the Philippines. So um, in, there are, we, we have to situate the types of employees here in the Philippines, I understand in different jurisdictions. 
there are certain classifications of employees that are not recognized here. So these are the only ones recognized under Philippine law. First are the regular employees who are engaged by an employer to perform activities which are usually necessary or desirable in the usual business or trade of the employer. On the other hand, um, project employees are those, are those um, who have been engaged for a specific project or undertaking the completion of which of the project is either determined or determinable at the time of the engagement of the employees. The next would be seasonal employees, which are those who perform services which are seasonal in nature and whose employment lasts during the duration of the season. So it's important to note that Project employees and seasonal employees are regular employees, and the difference between a permanent regular employee um, is, is that there is a duration. So for the project employees, they are regular for the duration of the project and for seasonal for the duration of the season. So they're expected to be rehired when the new season comes. Case law has added to this group of regular employees uh, by um, coining what we call the fixed term employment. So fixed term employees are hired as regular employees, but for a definite period of time. And when that period lapses, then the employment terminates. Okay, so then we have what we call casual employees, which, which is a, as opposed to the regular employees are those which are um, so the definition of the law is that they're not regular, they're not project, they're not seasonal. So they're, so they're performing work that are not usually necessary or desirable in the usual business or trade of the employer. However, a casual employee which has been hired for a year, uh, whether continuous or not, will become a regular employee. And the significance of that is the right to security of tenure. So the principle earlier that we said, which is essential under Philippine law, applies to regular employees, that no employee will be terminated, will, be, will have their employment severed unless there is a just or authorized cause under the law. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, there is also, uh, before I go to the basic rights of the employees, let me just discuss, um, the probationary employment. So um, this is recognized under the law that an employee can be engaged under a probationary basis for not exceeding six months from the date of hiring. So um, the probation is, is intended to determine the fitness of the employee to continue with the employment. So within the six-month probationary period, the employer is supposed to determine whether or not the employee should be regularized. So um, there should be the standards for regular, regularization should be made known at the start of the engagement. And the probationary employment should not be permitted to last more than the six-month probationary period. Otherwise, it will automatically convert into a regular employment. Now to the it. To terminate a probationary employ employee for failing to qualify for regularization, it will only require notice at least 24 hours from um, the severance of the employment. So it's actually an exception to the general rule on security of tenure. So that's, that's one of the exceptions to the, the stringent requirements on separating employees, probationary employees. It becomes contentious because um, we have we have encountered um, situations where the probationary employee says the standards for regularization will were not explained at the start of the engagement, or that there weren't any clear evaluation uh, or, or, or uh, matrix disclosed by the company. So they shouldn't be terminated for failure to qualify for regularization because the standards were not clear. Um, so let me move on to the basic rights and responsibilities of the employees. 
as I've said, these would, would constitute the labor standards provisions of the Philippine Labor Code. So <clears throat> in the Philippines, employers are required to pay their employees at least the minimum wage prescribed by law. It varies from um, region to region. And uh, it requires, the Philippine Labor Code requires that the employee must be paid in legal tender, <clears throat> even if other, even when the employee requests for, for payment otherwise. So under Philippine law, payments such as in cryptocurrency, in kind, and, and so on are not allowed. It has to be Philippine legal tender. And wages must be paid directly to the employee at least once every two weeks or twice a month at, inter at inter intervals not exceeding 16 days. The only exception is that if there's a force majeure or there's an emergency or circumstances beyond the control of the employer. There is also overtime pay recognized under Philippine law. So there is, there is a set standard um, number of hours for the workday, which is eight. And any, any work performed beyond the eight hours shall be subject to overtime pay. <clears throat> so the, over, the overtime pay is um, 20, uh, the regular wage of the worker plus 25%. And um, work performed beyond eight hours on a holiday or a rest day shall be paid an additional premium, which is equivalent to um, the rate of the first eight hours on a holiday or rest day plus at least 30 percent premium we also have what we call a night shift differential so these are for workers that that are performing work for customers elsewhere um so they they would have to work on a different time and and some of them would fall during night time so there is a premium accorded under the law um that uh, the night shift differential shall not be less than 10% of the employee's regular wage for each hour of work performed between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the Philippines. So we also have mandated meal periods and weekly rest periods. So for the meal period, um, employees shall have at least 60 minutes time off for their regular meals. And there has to be a rest period of uh, 24, <coughs> at least 24 consecutive hours after six consecutive normal work days. So the minimum is that you have 24 hours rest day and then you can do the six hours, uh, six days um, work week. But the normal, normally it's, it's five here in the Philippines and then you'll have two rest days. So when an employee is works with approval of the employer, whether required by the employer or approved by the employer, the employee shall be paid an additional premium of 30% of his regular wage. Um, yet another concept in Philippine law would be holidays. So we have several holidays, regular holidays and special holidays in the Philippines, and every worker shall be paid this regular daily wage during any unworked regular holiday. The employer may require an employee to work on any holiday, but such employee shall be paid a compensation equivalent to twice his regular rate. So to clarify, if it is unworked, there's still 100% of the, of the daily wage, but if the employee works, then it's going to be twice his regular rate. For work performed during a special holiday, which is a different kind, so we have regular and special, the employee shall be paid an additional compensation of at least 30% of his regular wage. So note the difference that um, it's an additional compensation. So if the employee works on the special holiday, there is an additional compensation. But if it is unworked, there is none. Um, if the special holidays falls on an employee's scheduled rest day, there is an additional um, compensation premium of 50% of his regular wage. And then moving on to the 13th month pay, um, the law requires all rank and file employees, regardless of their designation or employment status. Um, it entitles all rank and file employees, regardless of their designation or employment status, to 13 month pay, which is equivalent to 1 12th of the total basic salary earned by an employee within a calendar year, <laughs> provided that 
the employee has worked at least one month during the calendar year. So if it's less than, um, so it's, it's going to be prorated if the employee has less that has worked for less than the entire 12 month period. Then um, retirement pay. So it's required under the Philippines and employee may retire or be retired upon reaching the retirement age. So um, it, if there is a collective bargaining agreement, it will prevail or um, if there is a policy agreed upon. In case of retirement, the employee shall be entitled to receive the retirement benefits as he may have earned under any collective bargaining agreement or policy of the employee of the employer or under the existing laws so the minimum retirement benefit embodied under the philippine labor code would be that if an employee reaches the age of 60 and has served at least five years in an establishment um, the employee will get one month salary for every year of service um, the this is uh this is not the mandatory retirement age is 65 so the employee can opt for early retirement at the age of 60 provided that he has served he or she has served at least five years of work in the establishment but after the age of 65 the employee will be mandatorily re retired so um the retirement benefit is on top of any other entitlement under special laws, including the social security law. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so let me just go through quickly to the statutory leaves. The only provided leave under the Philippine Labor Code is what we call the service incentive leave, which is five days with pay with a minimum of one year of service. So this is actually the only statutory leave um, that does not require any special rule the others if you look at um, maternity leave paternity leave solo parental leave violence anti-violence against women and children leave and special women women's leave they, they would have specific requirements whereas the service incentive leave is an is um is a benefit given to all employees um, provided that they have performed work for a minimum of one year of service so um in normally when companies provide for vacation leaves or sick leaves um, they will subsume the service incentive leave under the law and um, the only the only uh, requirement for service incentive leave is that it must be it must be convertible to cash or it can be moved to the next year so, and until until the employee um, re resigns or is separated from service so the policy should be carefully crafted such that it can it should say that if if the employer is giving higher vacation leave and sick leave it should say that the first five days of leave um used by the employee is is the service incentive leave under the law so that you the employer is not burdened with um commuting or converting the the service incentive leave which is required under the law to be convertible to cash or move to the next years until availed upon by the employee. So the other leaves, uh, maternity leave benefit, which has been recently expanded to include 105 days with full pay with additional 30 days without pay. Paternity leave, seven day paid leave to a married male employee. And um, it, it also includes miscarriage. For solo parental parental leave, it's not more than seven working days every year, minimum of one year of service. Um, there is a special law called anti-violence against women and children in the Philippines, which also accords um, leave benefits to victims of, of violence up to 10 days, extendable when, nece when, the necess when the necessity arises as specified by the protection order. So it relates to the law really that issues, the law provides for a, a protection order to be issued in favor of the victim of violence. And so um, the leave of 10 days can be extended uh, to align with the protection order issued by the courts. Then you have the gynecological leave 
or the special women's leave, which is granted to a female employee who has rendered a continuous aggregate employment service of at least six months for the last 12 months, allowing her to recuperate following a surgery caused by a gynecological disorder. And the leave can um, be, the leave is up to two months or 60 days. So apart from leaves, next slide please. These are the other statutory benefits. So let me just go through them quickly. So we have special laws um, for the protection of the employ employee, which is the, first the social security law for, um, it protects from contingencies resulting from loss of income, including disability, sickness, maternity, um, old age, death, and others. Then we have the PhilHealth law, which is uh, which provides a comprehensive healthcare service for employees here in the Philippines. And the HDMF, uh, it pertains to the Home Development Mutual Fund, which is a government-owned and controlled corporation that provides Filipino workers access to a secured savings and affordable home financing. So, um, that these these three are actually required under the law, um, and, and including the employment compensation program. So the employment compensation program is actually subsumed under the social security system. It's being managed by the social security system. Okay, so let me just move on to the next slide. Ah, next slide, please. Um, may I request for to go to the next slide, please? Next slide. And next slide. Okay. The next slide discusses a principle um, under Philippine law of non-diminution of benefits. So um, any benefit that is contractually agreed upon by the parties, it cannot be diminished. So that's actually a basic contract provision, right? That um, if it's been contractually agreed upon, then it cannot be diminished without amendment, without consent of both parties. But then we also have this, this um, legal principle that even those that are voluntarily granted and not expressly agreed upon by the parties, it cannot be diminished um, if it has reach the status of company practice because there's now vesting in favor of the employee. So um, the an, a, a voluntary benefit that's not contractually provided ripens into company practice if it has been given over a long period of time, it's been given consistently and deliberately, and it's not been given due to an error. And um, so so we've, based on on on, the Philippine, uh, Philippine Supreme Court decisions on case law, the Philippine Supreme Court has recognized a policy to have ripened into company practice if it has been existing for, for at least two years. That's been the, the minimum that we've encountered. So uh, again, a voluntary benefit that's not, in, that's not in the policy, that's not in the contract, the employment contract, can nevertheless ripen into a demandable right and must not be diminished if it becomes a company practice. Next slide, please. Okay, let us go through the certain classes of protected workers in the Philippines. The first one are women workers. So there is actually um, special laws protecting these, um, these classes. So for women, we have the Magna Carta for women, um, which uh, the labor code as well as the Magna Carta for women actually provide protection in favor of women. For the labor code, it specifically provides that discrimination against women employees um, is unlawful and payment of lesser compensation or favoring a male employee over a female employee is actually violative of the labor code. In, um, in addition, the Magna Carta for Women considers discriminatory any practice that fails to provide for mechanisms to offset or address sex or gender-based disadvantages or limitations of women, resulting in the denial or restriction of any recognition or protection of their rights. So let me just go through the express, uh, express prohibitions under um, the law and its implementing regulations. To discharge any woman employee for purpose of preventing 
her from enjoying maternity leave and other benefits. To discharge such woman on account of her pregnancy or while on leave or in confinement due to her pregnancy. To discharge or refuse the admission of such woman upon returning to her work for fear that she may again be pregnant. To discharge any woman or any other employee for having filed a complaint or having testified or about are being about to testify and to require as a condition for or continuation of employment that a woman shall not get married or to stipulate expressly or tacitly that upon getting married a woman employee shall be deemed resigned or separated or to actually dismiss discharge or discriminate or otherwise prejudice a, a woman employee merely by reason of marriage so um Next slide. Another protected class are persons with disabilities. We have a special law called um, Magna Carta for Persons with Disability that entitles uh, PWDs an, opportunity, an equal opportunity for employment. So a qualified employee, employee with a disability shall be subject to the same terms and conditions of employment and the same compensation and privileges, benefits, incentives, and other allowances as any qualified able-bodied person. So discrimination of any qualified person with disability by reason of the disability regarding any job application, hiring, promotion, um, compensation training is prohibited. Dismissing or terminating the services of a disabled employee is also an act of discrimination unless the employer can prove that he impairs the he impairs the satisfactory the disability impairs the satisfactory performance of the work to the prejudice of the business so actually for persons with disabilities the employer is actually obliged by the law to provide what is called reasonable accommodation so a reasonable accommodation um, means that the employee the employer should have improved facilities in order to render these readily accessible to and usable by disabled persons uh, modifications of work schedules reassignments to vacant positions acquisitions or modifications of equipment or devices appropriate adjustments or modifications of examinations and any other accommodation to the disabled person that is considered reasonable next slide So another uh, protected class, which is actually subsumed by the, um, the, P, the Magna Carta for, for persons with disability is actually for mental health disabilities. So um, under the Magna Carta for disabled persons, the definition is broad enough to include um, any mental health related disability. So again, reasonable accommodations would be expected for people suffering from any mental health issue. Next slide, please. So I'm, move, I'm now moving on to another topic called occupational safety and health standards. So um, this is a, a recent law has been enacted um, on tightening the requirements for occupational safety and health in the Philippines. So the standards, um, they are intended to cover all types of businesses and non-government entities. The law offers broader safeguards to ensure the right of workers to safety and health and to arrest the marked increase in cases of diseases and injuries in the workplace. Next slide. Okay, so these are the duties of the employee, employers in relation to occupational safety and health. So furnishing the workers with a place of employment free from hazardous conditions, complete job safety instructions and orientation, informing workers of work-related hazards and health risks, using approved equipment and devices, compliance with the standards. The standards actually require specific personnel that would address occupational health and safety issues, so such as safety officers. Um, and then training, medical exa examination, and protected and safety devices. So measures to deal with emergencies and accidents, you will have, um, depending on the size of 
the workplace, you will have first aiders um, and health officers. So well, I think one question that was raised is what about those that are working from home or telecommuting? What will be the, the extent of the duties of the employers in relation to occupational health and safety? So that's actually uh, a gray area, but um, in the telecommuting agreement of the, of the work from home employee, of the telecommuting employee and the employer, there should be an agreement as to uh, the workplace, uh, for the employee to be allowed to work from home, the employer should prescribe minimum standards to ensure that, because if if during the course of the employment, if a work-related injury um, happens, then uh, because it is a gray area, then there is a risk of, of um, liability. So we encourage that in the telecommuting agreement, the employee should undertake certain obligations for him or her to be allowed to work from home such as ensuring you know um that that the place where he or she will work would would be safe um and and um would would limit the liability on the part of the employer so next slide please yeah um i should be yeah I should, this is just the last two topics. The first one would be for myself before I go. I, I give the floor to Caleb. So this this um, this stems from the right to security of tenure of workers. So under under Philippine law, in order to lawfully terminate an employee, the employer must have either a just or authorized cause for termination. So the the just causes is. Um, the, it's because of the acts of the employee, so it's it's with fault. Whereas the authorized causes would be because of certain exigencies of the business of the employee employer rather. So you will have redundancies based on reorganizations. The position has become superfluous, or due to certain financial constraints, there's a need to retrench certain employees or closure of business. These are authorized causes beyond the control of the employee. So those are the only two modes. And I said the exception would be for probationary employee who fail to qualify for regularization. Now, the power to terminate also includes the power to impose penalties less than termination. So if the employee has, has committed a misconduct, the employer has the management prerogative to determine what is the, the punishment, the penalty that's commensurate to the action. So um not all acts would merit termination because under the uh, philippine case law termination should be the ultimate penalty reserved only for the most serious of offenses under the law so it should um, the act of the employee should amount to the just causes under the law which would be serious misconduct gross and habitual neglect of duty fraud commission of a crime and other acts of the same gravity Next slide, please. So um, for, for a dismissal to be valid, it has to go through um, the, it, it has to be substantially sound, so substantively sound, meaning there is a ground for the dismissal. And number two is that it must be procedurally sound, so it must follow the procedural due process. So for a just cause termination, um, there is the, the twin notice and hearing requirement. Uh, for an authorized cost termination, there is a notification to the regulator, Department of Labor and Employment, and notice to the employee. Next slide, please. So for just cost termination, here are the grounds. Serious misconduct or willful disobedience to a lawful order of the employer gross and habitual neglect of duties, fraud or willful breach of trust, commission of a crime or offense by the employee against the employer or the employer's immediate family or his duly authorized representatives, and then other analogous causes would approximate the gravity of these causes mentioned earlier. And as I've said, the procedure is twin notice and hearing. Next slide, please. Um, for authorized causes, 
these are the causes. Um, and as I've said, these are beyond the control of the employee. employee. So normally it's an, um, because of the business of the employer. So installation of labor-saving devices, redundancy, retrenchment to prevent losses, closure or cessation of business. And then there is a peculiar case for disease, which is um, it's, uh, it's considered an authorized cause for termination, which would entitle the employee to separation pay. So if the disease is not curable within six months as certified by a competent public health authority and the con con continued employment of the employee is prejudicial to his health or to the health of his co-employees. But the process that this follows is actually not notification to the Department of Labor and Employment um, and the employee. It actually goes through the process for the just cause termination. The employee is given the right to contest the termination. So the employee can actually say that I, I, my disease is curable within six months and therefore I should not be terminated. Um, next slide. Um, okay. So uh, separation pay. Um, as I've said, what separates authorized causes from just causes would be that the dismissal for authorized causes because these are not because of the fault of the employee would require the employer to pay them separation pay. So if the reason for the termination is redundancy or installation of labor-saving devices, the separation pay is at least one month or at least one month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher. So it shouldn't be less than one month. If the reason for the authorized cost dismissal is retrenchment to prevent losses or closure or cessation of the business, it's it's half because there's a recognition that this is a finance there's financial difficulty on the part of the employer so it's one month pay for every year of service next slide so for um let me just articulate because earlier um i've said twin notice and hearing for just cause termination so in cases where the employee is at fault there must be a first notice informing the employee of the specific acts and grounds to cite him in to cite him for discipline or possibly termination. The employee will have the right to respond to the notice to explain within at least five calendar days. And in cases where the employee asks for an administrative hearing, the employer will have to grant that. And after the response and the administrative hearing, then the, the employer can now issue a decision, whether to suspend, to find that there are no grounds to discipline, or ultimately to terminate. Now, what if a termination fails to comply with the procedural due process? It will not invalidate the termination. So the employee will be considered validly terminated, but the employ employer will be penalized for um, nominal damages for failing to comply with the procedure. So if it is a just cause termination, it's 30,000 Philippine pesos. And if it is an authorized cause termination, it's 50,000 pesos, Philippine pesos. Next slide. Um, so if the employee files a case for illegal dismissal before the National Labor Relations Commission, here are the remedies that are given, reinstatement to the position, without loss of senior, seniority and then back wages for the period when um, he has been prevented from working. For reinstatement, the only exception is if there, are, if there are strained relations, then instead of ordering reinstatement, it will be separation pay in lieu of reinstatement. Next slide. Okay, so my final topic would be labor relations. Next slide. So um, under this is actually, as I've said, constitutional enshrined under Section 3, Article 13 of the 1987 Constitution. So all persons employed in an enterprise um, has the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist any labor organizations of their own choosing for purposes of collective bargaining. Um, so you have um, labor organizations at the national level, and it could also be at the enterprise level. Next slide. 
So the duty to collectively bargain. So if there is already um, a collective bargaining agent, so you will have the sole and exclusive bargaining agent in the work in the in the workplace shall act as the representative of all the employees in a bargaining unit that will negotiate a collective contract with the employer. In the absence of any agreement or other voluntary arrangement providing for a more expeditious manner of collective bargaining, it shall be the duty of the employer and the representatives of the employee to bargain collectively in accordance with the labor code. Um, next slide. So um, here are practices that are considered unfair labor practices uh, because they violate the rights of the workers to self-organization. Um, so it shall be considered an unfair labor practice to interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of their right to self-organization, to require as a condition of employment that a person or an employee shall not join a labor organization or, sh or shall withdraw from one to which he or she belongs, to contract out services or functions being performed by union members when such will interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in their exercise of their right to self-organization, to initiate, dominate, dominate, assist, or otherwise interfere uh, with the formation or administration of any labor organization, to discriminate, to discriminate in, regards, in regard of wages, hours of work, and terms of conditions of employment, in order to discourage union membership, to dismiss, discharge, or otherwise prejudice or discriminate against an employee for having been given or being about to give testimony, to violate their duty to bargain collectively, and to violate the collective bargaining agreement. Next slide. Okay, so um, that ends my portion. And I will now give the floor to my colleague, Caleb Laurendo. Thank you. Hi, good, hi, good afternoon. Um, I will uh, briefly discuss a few legal up updates here that uh, concerns the labor and employment here in the Philippines. Um, in 2022, as uh, in 2018, as uh, Rachel has mentioned earlier, the Philippine legislature has enacted the Telecommuting Act. Last year, in 2022, the Department of Labor and Employment issued the revised and implementing rules and regulations of the Telecommuting Act. In the said IRR, the definition of the term alternative workplace was clarified. Uh, it was defined as any location where work through the use of telecommunication and or computer technology is performed at a location away from the principal place of business of the employer, including but not limited to the employee's residence, co-working spaces, or other spaces that allow for mobile working. This is in contrast of a regular workplace, which is the principal place of business, or any branch office or physical premises established or provided by the employer, where employees regularly report to perform work. Under uh, Section 8 of the Revised Implementing Rules, the employer is mandated to ensure that telecommuting employees are given the same treatment as those comparable as those comparable to employees working at the employer's regular workplace. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, please. In uh, addition to the telecommuting, in addition, telecommuting employees are also uh, entitled to receive a rate of pay, including overnight, overtime and night check differentials and other monetary benefits, not lower than those provided by law or the collective bargaining agreement for uh, authorized hours of work done at home or at an alternative workplace. They also have the right to rest days, holidays, the same equivalent workload and performance standards with those working in the regular workplace of the employer without and without additional cost, the same access to training and career development opportunities as those uh, at the, working at the regular workplace of the employer. They're also entitled to receive appropriate training on the technical equipment at their disposal, of course, without additional cost. And uh, they're also entitled to have the same collective rights as the workers at the employer's premises 
and cannot be barred from cannot be barred by the employee from communicate employer from communicating with the workers employees next slide please Uh, also included in the revised implementing rules is the protection given to telecommuting employees that uh, telecommuting shall not in any way diminish or impair the terms or conditions of employment contained in any applicable company pal policy or practice, individual contract, or collective bargaining agreement, and that work performed in an alternative workplace shall be considered as work performed in the regular workplace at the of the employer, and that at all times that an employ employee is required to be on duty and that and all the time that an employee is permitted or suffered to work in an alternative workplace shall be counted as uh, hours of work further the implementing rules provide that facilities equipment and supplies necessary to implement a telecommuting program and to enable the employee to perform his or her work in the alternative workplace including the expenses for the acquisition of such facility, proper handling, usage, maintenance, repair, and return are considered ordinary and necessary expenses of the business of the employer. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, we have uh, an important Supreme Court decision that came out uh, last year, 2022. Uh, this is the case of uh, Ditiangkin, versus Lazada e-services Philippines. In in the case of the Tiangkin, a two-tiered test was used in determining whether an employer employee relationship existed between the company which is uh, the employer and the complainants who were delivery riders for the company. As we know, um the company here is a is a global e-commerce e platform. The Supreme Court used the fourfold test which Rachel discussed earlier and the economic dependency test which is another form of test in arriving at the conclusion that the delivery riders utilized by the company to deliver the products ordered through their online platform are considered as employees of the latter under the fourfold test the factors mentioned are the the right to selection of the employee the payment of wages the power to discipline and dismiss and and most importantly the power of control to, to control the employee's conduct the power of control is the most significant factor in the fourfold test. In that case, the Supreme Court stated that when the control is the control test is insufficient, the economic realities of the employment of employment are considered to get a comprehensive assessment of the true classification of the worker. Supreme Court also stated uh, in, in this case, the Supreme Court found that uh, the riders were economically dependent upon the the company. Further, the Supreme Court stated that the riders cannot be considered as independent contractors as there's a bilateral relationship and the work they perform do not require special skill or talent or that they were hired due to their unique ability or competency as they were uh, delivery riders of the e-commerce platform. This case is important as, as what I've said as it, said, uh, as it sets a pre precedent that the economic dependency of the independent contractor on the principal is now a determining factor on whether there exists an employer-employee relationship between the two parties on top of the fourfold test. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand. Thank you. With that, I'll hand you over, guys, to Dan for the question and answer portion of the session. Thank you very much, um, Rochelle and Caleb, for your incredibly detailed presentations. Just looking at the time, unfortunately, we will need to wrap up here. Um, but we have had plenty of questions in. Please do rest assured if you send a question in, we will send it on to the panel. They'll be able to get back in touch with you and have that question answered. You can see the contact information um, for Rochelle on the um, slide right now. So please do get in touch if you would like any further information. But once again, thank you to our wonderful panel for today and for their presentations, for their time. Uh, we really do appreciate it and thank you to our audience for being with us too um have a lovely rest of your day we hope to see you again soon goodbye